anytime I do one of these secrets of videos, I, I kind of laugh to myself a little bit because to me, the concepts I'm talking about, they're not secrets at all. They're a totally normal part of the way that I work. But the more I go around to my gigs and teach my lessons and just work as a musician, the more I realize most people don't get the stuff I'm talking about. To them, it really is a secret. And these are not subtle secrets at all. The, the difference between knowing the things I'm talking about and not knowing them, it's like science has shown that if you think the way I'm talking about with improvisation, you literally learn faster, your potential is greater. This is a complete paradigm shift from the way most people are taught to think about music as a language and improvisation in general. So I think this is a really, really valuable information that's coming up here. Um, but it, there's a lot in this video. So use the lesson navigator below to help you find your way to the different parts as much as you possibly can. Um, that'll probably help you kind of, you know, digest the material properly, I think. Um, let me talk about the structure of the video a little bit. The first thing I want to address is a bit about the psychology of improvisation. I want to talk about just some really common myths that people have about learning music and just really kind of set the record straight as much as I can. And after that, I want to break into a section about practical tools that I've pulled out from Raga land. Just, uh, Raga is a very deep tradition of improvisation and they've developed a lot of really good strategies for getting good at improvisation. So I'm going to try to pull some things out of that that you can work with with this new concept of improvisation. And at the end, I'm going to talk about the scope of the Raga series. This whole Blues Raga series is going to begin with a certain set of techniques and end with a certain set of other ones. I want to explain what that whole thing is and tie it into all these concepts about improvisation that we're talking about. Because so far, we've, we've really unlocked the secret of the DNA phrases, and that is a huge, huge thing. And we're not even done with that yet. We're going to develop that even further. But you know, there are things even beyond that. The, um, the really special thing that Indian musicians know how to do is take those DNA phrases and develop them to these really long forms of improvisation. And before we get to that, we have to talk about how we solo over chord changes and just how we use these DNA phrases in shorter forms of improvisation and just like jamming contexts. But all that is stuff we still need to cover. So yeah, let's get into the first section. The main idea that I want to stress in this whole section is that music is a language. And it, it seems like an obvious thing to say, but when you talk to most people, you realize most people think of music as an art form, an abstract art form that requires like a special talent to be able to do. And this is absolutely not true. Um, it, the fact is that if you can speak, if you can have a normal conversation with people, you can definitely jam just as well as anybody else. And in fact, even a lot of people who can't have a normal conversation, even people who are speech impaired or even just aren't that articulate, even they can do music because music is in fact the most accessible language of all for some very special reasons. I mean, here's, here's the way you want to think about it. Every conversation you have with any person is an improvisation. You know, most musicians um, are used to thinking of, you know, learning certain pieces of music and performing them, but the fact is that, you know, if people walked around just kind of giving speeches all the time, you know, like if you went to the grocery store and you pulled out a little script you wrote in the morning and said, I need bread and cheese, how much will it cost? You know, you'd find that really, really unusual. You're used to just kind of going throughout your normal life talking to people and having conversations, but every conversation is an improvisation. And the fact is if you grew up only having to speak music as a language, you'd be really, really good at jamming. It'd be no big deal because that's just what your brain knows how to do. Every human has in their hardwired in their genetic code a part of their brain that knows how to figure out conversational things. And the fact is that music is really no different from the ability to do that. Um, and the other thing that you want to understand about music, the thing that makes it different from most spoken languages is that it has more whole brain potential than spoken languages. It can affect more parts of your brain more easily than spoken languages. It can affect more emotional centers, more movement centers. And so basically, if you have an, the idea is that if you have an impairment in some part of the brain, if you're maybe not so good at math or not so good at dancing or not so good at having conversations, there's usually some way that music can be wired in your brain that gets around your weaknesses. And you, you, when you study music therapy, which I, which I did when I was in college, that's what you that's what you learn. You realize that you, you see these amazing things all the time. You see these autistic kids who have selective mutism. They can't talk to most people. They just refuse to have conversations at all. 
if they even learned how to speak ever, but you find it's often very easy to teach them music and to have sort of a musical dialogue with them. And you can't communicate certain concrete things as well, but you can always find ways to communicate with music and to get the same kind of goals accomplished. And the other thing that's just incredibly amazing, I, I can't count on hands and toes the number of people I know who have seen people in nursing homes who have Alzheimer's and you know they, they can't remember anyone in their family's name, they can't remember their own name, they can't remember anything about their life, but if a musician comes in and starts playing songs from when they were a kid, they remember all the words, they can start tapping their foot along, just like, and something comes over them that is just unlike what the whole rest of their life looks like. And the reason that both of those things happen is because, is because of this whole brain potential of music, is that music has a way to reach so many different parts of our mind, and it just does this completely naturally, whereas most kind of spoken languages just put us in a little block. So the fact is that music can find a way to reach anything in our hearts, in our souls, in our minds that we need it to if you work with it in the right way. And, and you want to start out with that assumption because people who believe that you have to have like a special musical gift to work with it, you, you see they don't learn things as quickly and they give up on most things that they try before they really get anywhere. So that's a really, really important concept to understand. It's really important that you understand that music is not just like any other language that you learn, but it's, it's this special kind of whole brain language. Um, at the same time, the thing you gotta understand about this is that it might mean that in order for you to be good at music, it would take you as much time to do that as it would take you to like learn a second language, like Spanish or something. And then, and then again, then again, maybe not. Because the one difference between you know, a, a conversational language and music is kind of the expectations that go with it. Like when you say, I, hey, I speak a language, people can expect, they can talk to you about anything. But with music, you're not necessarily expected to be able to play with every person who plays any kind of music ever. You can often, you know, go into it like a specific kind of place. You can go into a coffee shop and just play a couple of songs and it's still counted as music. It's not like you have to be able to jam with anyone who might show up in that coffee shop. So even though to be really, really good at a particular style of music, it might take you as long as it takes to learn a second language, and that's that's a fairly realistic expectation, I think. But at the same time, you the way you want to try to get to there is by breaking it up into smaller goals, you know, and, and realizing that not all genres are equally difficult. I mean, if, fact, it doesn't take as long to learn to play a three chord pop song really well as it does to take to like play like crazy progressive rock licks like Steve Vai. Those things just are not equally difficult. You know, prog rock just takes a lot more work to be convincingly good at than it does to take to strum a couple of chords. And you can use that to your advantage. What you can do is you can look at the level of music that you're at if you're a total beginner or if you've only learned a couple of things and you can figure out, okay, where do people want to hear this type of music or where might I be able to make a difference playing what what is at my level and get a little bit better at that rather than saying, oh man, I don't have time to like learn a whole second language. I don't think I can do this. You can find ways to do little, little things that will get you to where you want to go. And that's that's a real key thing of learning is that your brain needs feedback. You need to feel like you're accomplishing something in order to keep going. I mean, even people with the, just the grittiest willpower, you know, they, 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 can, they can work on something and work on something and work on something, but anyone is going to wear out eventually. Anyone is eventually just going to see, even if they really like working on something, they'll eventually see, well, this doesn't make a difference to anyone except for me. And the fact is there might be something else I could do that would be better for me. Than, than working on something that doesn't matter to anyone and then it'll eventually give up. So what you really want to do is you know look at musical language, but figure out what's something small enough that I can do with the time that I have and and figure out a way to make a difference with it. And and also the other key thing to do is is, is look at two ways of learning music. One of them is just immersing yourself in it. Anyone who talks about learning a language talks about immersion and you know that's the way our brains are really wired to learn stuff. You, it's just kind of around and you almost kind of pick it up by accident but then you know you, you start going throughout life and you know it starts to pop back and you just start to hear music in your head or you just start to like throw out a Spanish phrase here and there because you just happen to know it at the right time. You know that's that's a really big part of it is just learning music by immersion. If you want to learn something in music you just got to listen to it a lot and, and you just got to trust that there's a part of your brain that will just pick it up and start working with it in the way that it needs to. At the same time, everyone knows that just because you like go to bluegrass concerts all the time doesn't mean you're going to be able to be like a crazy finger picker. There's some things in music that you really can't pick up without doing some critical study. Your brain really needs to be pushed in the right way to pick up certain things. And so you want to mix that in. 
you know, and that's where like exercise is coming. That's where you take the things that don't just come naturally to most people and you and you really take the time to study them. And when you really kind of push your brain to getting those things down, then it mixes with the other side of your brain that's just, just kind of picking stuff up passively and your brain is able to piece things together and make it into language. And and, and that's sometimes the hardest thing is, is, is this aspect of trusting your brain to just figure it out. You know, a lot of people want to have a sense of control of the process. They want to say, I want to know what I have to put in in order to be able to get this. Or they feel like I've put in all this work and it's just not happening for me yet. And that's understandable because like I said, music is a language and it might take you as long to be really good at music as it takes to learn a whole other language or the, as long as it took you to learn, learn your first language. And, you know, to, to some degree that's to be expected. And I, I've looked for a lot of cheats. I've looked for a lot of hacks to get around it and I really don't think I've found any that I really believe in. Um, but at the same time, you don't have to have total control of the process because the fact is that w rather than trying to understand every single aspect of everything that's going to happen and knowing exactly how long it's going to take, what you want to try to do is trust that y your brain is designed to work this brain. Your, your brain has parts of it that know how to work with language without you being able to analyze it. You know, just by being around music, the part of your brain that picks up music just picks it up and works with it in the way it's supposed to. It's an engine built for exactly that purpose, and it and, and it will work without you understanding. And so, to a certain degree, you just want to trust that if you do the right things and you put yourself in the right positions, that eventually the results you want are going to come. And the key is, if the results that you want haven't come yet, a lot of times you just need to put more time into it. That's the number one thing. That a, lot, a lot of people get frustrated before they get to the goal they want to get to, and I guarantee you that that's normal. Everyone experiences that. I don't know anyone who gets to the musical things they want to get to right when they want to get there. You know, even with the very best teacher in the whole world, and even with just the right method, it's almost impossible to never feel frustrated. And part of you has to expect that, but just have some faith in the process that if you do some exercises, but then also just kind of make music an informal part of your life where you're listening to the stuff that you want to do, that eventually it's going to come together for you. So now that we kind of have this theory of how music is like a language and how you want to learn it like a language, I really want to talk about some practical issues at hand. I mean, the first thing you really want to get down when you're looking at improvising is just how do you play spontaneously? How do you just play what you hear in your head? You know, if you hear something, you know, how do you just make sure that what you are hearing is going to come out in your hands? Or I guess if you're singing in your singing or whatever instrument you're playing. Um, and I think my favorite thing I've ever come across on this topic is a book called Zen and the Art of Archery. And I mean, I, a lot of musicians have been telling me about this book for years. And for a while, I was like, how does this relate to music? And then I read it, and I, I, I started to understand that even though the book is about archery, it's about shooting arrows, you can look at the process that a Zen master has, and you can realize you can apply it to anything. Because what a Zen master is basically doing in any of these Zen and the Art of books is they're talking about how to learn some kind of activity, some kind of performance activity, and you learn it from the very basic technical details and build it up into this very sort of complex ritual that you can eventually do, but once you've gotten so good at it, you can forget that you're doing it. You can almost become unconscious of it and go to like a totally different state of mind, a Zen state. That's really what the whole Zen and the art of thing is about. It's about getting so good at something that you can forget that you're doing it and go to this whole other state of mind. And that's really what improvisation and spontaneous music is about, is you want to be playing notes, but you don't want to have to feel like you're thinking too much about the notes. You just want it to come out really fluidly so you can really express yourself and really be in the moment, because that's what creates that Zen state, is really feeling like like you can connect your ear to your hands and have it not feel like really, really difficult. So, and, and like any great musician that I know has talked about this. I think my favorite example is like John McLaughlin. He's a really famous jazz fusion guitarist, played on all the Miles Davis albums, has a lot of incredible stuff with just many, many projects. I love his project tracks with Shakti. And he really phrases it as, I feel like I want the music to play me. You know, when I play a really good concert, I feel like the music plays me rather than me playing the music. Um, that's the way he talks about it. And um, two other musicians I really like, uh, Chris Thiele, the great mandolin player from Nickel Creek, and Tommy Emmanuel, the really famous fingerstyle guitarist. I've heard them both say that they work in the practice room to get to the point where they feel like the technique disappears. They want to feel like it totally dissolves. They want to make sure that they almost don't have to feel like they're playing anything at all. They want it to just like totally dissolve into this musical experience. And when you've practiced enough, you eventually get to that point. 
Um, so it, you know, great, great musicians all talk about this. So it's something that anyone who works at enough can get to. And it's really something you really want to shoot for. Um, and the thing you need to start out with is just exercises that train your hands, at least if you're a guitarist, to train your hands to do the, the movements that are most likely for them to do. Because every musical style is finite. There's only certain things you have to do. And if you try to do everything, you'll be there forever. But rather than trying to do everything, you want to try to learn the motions that your hand needs to do the most and get really, really good at them so that they're automatic. And you know, once you've done that, another thing that you can be doing, actually you can be doing it this at the same time, is ear training exercises, where you're listening to certain things that happen in music, or you're listening to certain you know computer programs that maybe play certain common musical gestures, and you're learning, okay, what is this? What kind of interval is this? What kind of scale is this? And you know, how does that relate to notes? You're kind of piecing music together in your head, so that when you hear something in your head, you you understand what it is, you can identify it somehow, and then you learn to combine that with all the hand exercises you did somewhere else, so that you have this coordination of the hand and the ear. And that's when spontaneous music can start to happen. When you can do your hand exercises and coordinate that with the ear training that you've done, then you have this kind of complete connection between the ear and the hand. And when you hear something, you can play it back. If you hear something that you want to improvise, your hands know how to do it. It's a total kind of response loop that goes on, and that's how musical language is created. Um, and so the key is just building the vocabulary of whatever style it is you're doing, and doing that as concisely as possible so that you know you can deal with the situations that are gonna come up in whatever you're playing. Uh, one analogy I like to use, it's, it's kind of like, it's almost like farming in a way. It, bear with me, it's, it, this analogy totally works. So your mind is like a field. It's just like a bunch of dirt with nothing growing in it. You can put anything in there that you want. Um, and when you kind of listen to music, that tends to plant seeds. You hear something that really kind of piques your interest. And that's like a little idea is born. A little spark of inspiration gets planted in that soil. And you might forget about it. In fact, you're really likely to forget about it. Only like the grandest moments of inspiration are you going to remember constantly. But the fact is you don't have to remember everything. Your subconscious mind stores a lot, a lot of information that you don't have to remember constantly. But once you start getting into a musical mode, it just comes up. It just arises out of nowhere. It's like, I don't remember planting that seed there, but you see a couple of little green leaves popping out of the ground out of nowhere. And you don't have to know where every seed gets planted. It will just come up um, on its own. At the same time, not every kind of plant grows equally well in all soil. You know, some, like a crop like corn, needs a lot of nitrogen in the soil. And a crop like chicory needs not quite so much nitrogen in the soil. You can't grow everything in every kind of soil. You can't grow any kind of music just by listening to it. You know, you need to do different kinds of exercises to train your hands and your ear to do different kinds of things. So what you do is you do these exercises to work the land so that the seeds that you put in there can grow properly. And then just over time, you know, when you just kind of like live through your musical life, when you go play music with people, when you practice in your basement or wherever, or wherever you are, um, these ideas just kind of grow on their own. And naturally over time, they grow into these nice musical plants that can give you fruit back. And, and then, you know, when you start to get really advanced, when you start to grow a really nice, you know, you know, a musical idea, you know, you can get seeds from it for new musical ideas that can go even further. So you can, I really kind of like that farming analogy because it really kind of expresses, you know, you have to work the land, you have to plant the right seeds in there, but, you know, once you've given it time, really, really good ideas kind of grow out of it naturally, you know, and it, it, it almost, you don't have to like watch every little blade of grass grow. You don't have to manage every single aspect of your musical life. A lot of it just happens when you just play. You know, and if you never ever play, if you don't have a habit of jamming, um, improvisation doesn't really happen. You know, it all you, know, you get really good at exercises, but real music doesn't happen. So, you know, stick that one in your, you know, stick that one in your uh, file it away and see how it works for you over the time. Um, and the the thing you really want to think about when it comes to working exercises into your playing is that this part of your brain that really does improvisation. It, it will find a way to take anything that your hand does and work it into improvisation. So the key is you got to just do the exercises that you're working on really, really faithfully. You know, because when you first start trying to work them into jamming, they're not going to happen. Um, it's going to feel kind of stuck, or you'll feel like you just start playing the exercise, and you're going to be like, this isn't improvisation, this is just an exercise. Um, but, you know, again, this is where it comes back to the trust thing. you got to trust that if you do the exercise, your brain will find ways to work those motions into things that you're doing. And even if it gets to the point where you've really mastered an exercise and it's still not kind of showing up in your solos the way you want it to, 
I mean, what you can do is you can go back to that exercise, but just start to think of it in a more abstract way. Rather than doing the exercise just straight through like this note goes to this note in this exact order, you just start to like change the order on purpose. Like if you can take something as basic as a scale, once you can play a scale, you know, top to bottom, just start playing random notes in that scale. You know, just start with this note and then go to that note. But anything you can do to break up the order of it and start to think in that of that scale in a way that's not just in a straight line will give your brain more ways to work with it. And, and, and it's of developing those different ways of thinking of that exercise abstractly. That's how you start to get ideas that work into improvisation more easily. The more you've broken down an exercise into little parts that you can throw into little phrases, just the way the DNA phrases or these tiny little units of music, those are the things your brain really likes to work with, these tiny little bits that it can weave together into these complex phrases. So the, that, that's really the key to making things natural is work on an exercise, try to bring it into jamming a little bit, and if it's not working out for you, work on the exercise in a little bit more of an abstract way, but also make sure you got the basic exercise really, really solid, because if you don't have the basic thing down, down rock solid, it's not going to work its way into jamming. It's not going to want to go there. It has to be really fluid. And it, and just the key is work your exercises into any kind of jamming that you do. Any type of improvisation you feel comfortable with is good, but you got to have it as like a regular habit that you do. Possible things that you might do if you haven't started a jam habit yet or just you know going on YouTube or just searching the internet for backing tracks and playing over those. If, if you're into rock and roll or any type of popular music like blues, there's tons of backing tracks you can get free out there. Nothing stopping you from doing that. Getting together with uh, other people who play whatever type of music you're doing, that's really the best thing you can do is play with other people, especially people who are at the level you want to be at so that they can teach you things. Um, that's really ideal. When I didn't have anyone to play with or any type of computer access, you know, if I was just traveling around or when I was in college and I had to just bounce around between buildings and carry my guitar, I just would play by myself in stairwells, you know, and because one thing about practicing is you want it to feel good because that keeps you going. And I find that if you can find a place, like some building or some, you know, it can be a cave, you know, for all that it matters. If you can find some place where you feel really comfortable playing and the, if the place makes it sound better, that's even better, you can just go there and play whatever type of music you're doing. But just the experience of being in that space can sometimes get you going on jamming and just make it more comfortable to explore the ideas that you're into. I used to teach guitar lessons in stairwells all the time, and that does amazing things for people's improvisation because they just want to mess around with stuff in this really good sounding environment where all the echoes are happening or you know, churches are a very similar thing. If you can just find an empty church sometimes, just go jam in there. It's always a cool thing. Um, you know, you can always take the exercises you're doing and try to write things. That's another way to build abstract material is to just try to write something that's different from the exercise that you did but uses the ideas. And that's a really good way to hardwire ideas in your brain. Because once you've written something and you've memorized it, it's really, it's ingrained in you. And that's really what you want. Um, back in the day, before they had all these fancy tools on phones and apps that can chop songs into pieces and slow them down, people used to just they used to just play over vinyl records. You know, they'd take a record player and just make it go, or they would slow it down so they could practice the solos. You know, you can always just play with records and see what you find from that, because then you get the organic experience of the whole music with you all the time, and you're more likely to pick up things. You know, like I said, passively just by hearing them and letting them be internalized into your subconscious, um, and the next section I want to talk about, my absolute favorite technique for practicing improvisation, and that's practicing with drones. So when you're learning Indian classical music, you are almost always practicing over a drone, and usually the drone is made by an instrument called a tampura, and basically it's just a really big tall instrument that kind of looks like a sitar with no frets. And it just has these big long strings and you just hit the open strings. You go boing, 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 boing. And it just plays these strings. And the and the strings are usually tuned to something very, very simple, like a root and a fifth, or a root and a fourth. They're usually the root and some other note. But the root happens a couple of times, and maybe this other note happens once or twice. Uh, but the key is that it only plays a couple of very simple notes to kind of set 
some patterns into the air for you to resonate the other notes against. And this is an incredibly powerful technique for practicing. It, it solves so many problems. It's just, it's a, it's a great, great technique for practicing. And I think the first thing you need to understand about music to help you understand why drones are so great is for me to explain a little bit about what I call phrase states. I'll go into more detail about phrase states in another video, but the basic idea is that at any given time, there's certain notes that it might be, you know, a good idea to play and other notes that might not be such a good idea. And I mean, it's, it's, it's both it's relative to expression. It, sometimes people want to play dissonant notes on purpose, but you, it's important to understand what notes are going to be dissonant and why in any particular time. And this is the whole, the whole concept of phrase states. It tells you why would you play different notes at a different time. And it's got to do with kind of like, you know, what other notes are being played at the same time, um, what other th what notes have been played before and after it. And uh, it's it, it really what you're trying to figure out is what notes are going to create tension and what notes are going to relieve it. And that's really the key of what you're going to try to understand. And this is a this is a very complex thing because it's evolving constantly. Every second of music, the, the kind of the phrase state changes, maybe a little bit. Sometimes it can change very, very quickly. And so the easiest way to understand this is just to look at intervals first, like musical intervals. You put two notes together, what do they sound like? And if you put two of the same note together, it sounds great pretty much no matter what, you know, because it's just the same note. If you put two notes that are a perfect fifth apart or any note that fits with another note's harmonic series really well, they're going to sound great together. When notes have consonant harmonic series, they, uh, they, they, they just sound good together. That's, that's one of just the natural properties of music. And I'll, again, I'll get into greater detail about that later, but the key is what you want to know is that there's a whole spectrum of combinations of intervals of notes, and some of them when they are they have harmonic series that align, they're gonna sound great together. And the more dissonant the harmonic series get, the less the notes are gonna to fit together. And that is gonna happen pretty much no matter what kind of music you're playing or what time in the music. Um, and that's a very scientific thing. You can really kind of pin that down to science and have it be completely like, you know, you can know exactly what's going on with it. The key is that once you start to get into like real music and when you're not just playing two notes, People's conditioning and what what people what people have been hap yeah what people have been hearing in one particular like sitting of listening to music that can change how you interpret intervals. Uh, certain aspects of how you think can kind of supersede that basic awareness of what the intervals sound like. And the further you get into the music, the more complex that whole phrase state gets. So what you often want to do is start to think about phrase states in these little snapshots of like what sounds good at this particular time and then at this particular time because um, when you start out you know with something like ragas ragas are usually a very kind of stable phrase state the idea is these are the types of notes that you want to play in this particular order for the whole performance that doesn't really change you really learn what the notes are you learn what their relationships are and that really doesn't change you may do more complicated things with those orders of notes but the note relationships themselves don't really change ragas have extremely stable phrase states when you start to get into playing over chord changes the phrase states change much more quickly every time you change a chord the notes that resonate with that chord change constantly because the notes in the chord are different. And so now with all these new notes resonating in the air, you got to figure out which notes are going to resonate with the new notes rather than the old notes. So, and that's just a basic thing to be aware of. What's neat though, is that when you practice with a drone, that lets you work on what it's like to play over one chord. And then you can just change to playing over what it's like to play over another chord in a whole separate practice session and you can get good at them separately and then gradually weave them together. It makes playing over more complex chord changes a much more accessible thing. Cause when you just start out right away, trying to play over like giant step changes, like, there's a John Coltrane song called giant steps where it changes keys, you know, w you know, sometimes within a single bar, it'll change keys just constantly. If you try to start out with that, you're not going to be able to do it. It's too difficult. But what you can do is you can learn how to play over one of those chords and just play over it like it's a drone and then work on the next chord and the next chord and the next chord and then gradually weave them all together faster and faster and faster until you're playing crazy bebop chromatic changes and you're totally at home. You know, playing over drones makes this a very, very accessible thing. Um, there's some drawbacks to working with it though. I mean, I've done this with a lot of people and not everyone likes playing over drones. And that's why some other options like backing tracks might work better for you. I mean, you can have backing tracks that are over just one chord. You know, that will give you basically the same harmonic effect. 
The only other disadvantage to working with drones is that there's no rhythm to them. The drone doesn't really make a pulse or any kind of rhythm. And in, in, in a way that can be a good thing because then you don't have to think about rhythm. You can just focus on the notes. And when you're really starting out with a type of music, that's a really good advantage actually. But if your goal is to be like a funk bass player or a drummer and you're playing an instrument that's really, really focused on rhythm where your sense of the pulse is everything, you don't want to use a drone. You don't want to use a drone for anything that really demands that the rhythm be really, really particular. But even as you're working into something, like if you're if, if you're like want to be like a, a rock guitar soloist, your timing is still important. But when you're starting working out with phrases, it's often easier to start with drones because then you can you can deal with the melodies first and then get to the rhythmic stuff later. And that that really is a huge advantage. The other two big advantages of working with drones. It, the first one is that you can hear the interval interactions of notes very, very clearly. You know, when you've got one or two notes in the air that really project their harmonic series really steadily, it's really easy to hear how other notes resonate against it, and that really, really builds up your awareness of you know, interval interactions. And that really carries over into any other type of music very, very well. So it's a good place to start to really build up your ear so that you don't get confused by other things happening in the music. And it, I find it's a really clear lens. It's like not every type of music just plays a drone, but the things that happen in a drone, the interval interactions that happen when a drone is playing, they still happen in every other type of music. And if you use a drone improvisation as a template, if you kind of train your ears in that condition, you'll find that your ears are very well suited to pretty much anything else you're going to play. It really gets it really gets your kind of fundamental knowledge of interval interaction built up so that when other types of chord changes start to happen or other types of phrase states occur, you're very well prepared for them. So, I mean, I, I've, just, I've just found that from experience. It works really, really well. The other neat thing about playing with drones is that they're kind of relaxing. They're, they're very sort of, um, it's very sort of ambient, very sort of meditational way of practicing that puts you in a really nice relaxed state. And it, it makes it easier to practice. You're, you don't get quite so stressed out. It just sounds nicer to just mess around with notes over a drone than it, than it does to just kind of playing them in a dead, empty, dry room. So, I mean, I, I found it makes it much easier to practice longer when a drone is going on. There's a couple of different tools that I'm working on with this series and some other series that I'm developing, that, and they all have to do with drones. Um, one of them is called Winter of a Thousand Years. It's... Um, it's a special computer program where you have a little man walking across the screen who catches snowflakes on his tongue, and every time he catches a snowflake, it plays a note, and it kind of creates these really neat ambient soundscapes, and they're very dronal soundscapes. It'll kind of mess around with a bunch of notes in a particular key, and it, it this program will sort of make these make these soundscapes that are very drone-like, and then what I find is I'll record those, and then I'll do improvisations over them and it sounds really really cool and because you can switch this program into being in all kinds of modes and all kinds of chords and all kinds of like pentatonic scales you can really get precise about the phrase state that you're practicing so that's one tool I've developed to to practice over drones that can take you over the states it would be like to practice over all kinds of chords and all kinds of different keys um, Another tool I'm going to talk about a little bit later is my whole Ingrid system, or I guess I could, it's the Infinity Grid is the long form of it, which basically just says, okay, if you're playing over a drone, here's all the kind of note formulas you'd need to deal with. Here's all the arpeggios, here's all the scales, blah, 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 all that stuff that you're likely to run into. Um, but practicing that stuff over a drone is this really excellent preparation for any type of music you're going to do because it covers all the really common finger combinations that just show up in music from all over the world and from all different time periods. And then later in this series, we're going to get into the process of doing alap, jor, and jala, these Indian forms. And that all happens over a drone too. So these are all tools that you know I've worked with that help me develop improvisation through doing dronal exercises, but that really will work into all kinds of other things. So keep an eye out for those. But I think uh, the next section, I want to go into even a couple of more tools that we can use to develop improvisation. So now I want to talk about the bigger picture of the Blues Raga course and a whole different type of improvisation. And it's also kind of composition too. It's, it's what I call scratching the itch composing and improvisation. Um, when you are learning to just kind of play what you hear and kind of be in the moment, that's exactly what it's about. It's about being in the moment. And what you're developing when you're learning to do 
you know, kind of off the cuff improvisation is what's called crystallized knowledge. You're trying to get really good at a very narrow set of things that you're really, really comfortable with and then learn how to kind of play with them. But the key is it's got to do with this very basic knowledge of the same sorts of things that you get really, really comfortable with and you get kind of very good at being in that box. Um, and this is going to happen to anyone who spends enough time around any particular type of music. Anyone who's listened to anything and practices it enough is going to get really, really comfortable with what they're working with and that it just happens over time and there's a lot of musicians who have a lot of chops and who can who have very very good skills in a particular style but they still just get this they get this feeling of they want to be able to express something that they don't quite have but they don't know what it is you know it, it, this is different from like hearing a note and not knowing how to play it this is like feeling like I it, you have this sort of ineffable desire to express something, but you don't really have any idea of how to do it. You can't hear notes that fit it yet. Um, and uh, I think Eric Whitaker, uh, the famous choral composer, is the guy who kind of gave me the phrase. He said when he composes, a lot of times he says he has like this itch he can't scratch. It's just this kind of vague feeling of like uh, there, there's something I'm looking for. You know, and it, and it can be all kinds of things. For me, sometimes it's just I want to say something to someone or I want something that makes me feel a certain way. But it's not like I have these notes and I, I have this idea of like, what if I took these notes and played with them this way? It's, it's not an idea like that. It's more of like sort of like a vague longing to have something you don't have yet. Um, and and just, this is going to happen to anyone who gets into any sort of creative mode with any type of music eventually. And... And there's all kinds of ways that you can resolve it. The Blues Raga series gives you tools to resolve this as well, because when you're learning all your scales and your improvisation stuff, you're learning how to be in the box, but you're also you know, learning tools to, quote, scratch the itch. Because if you learn how to manipulate the blues tools to kind of extend beyond themselves, then when you get this feeling of like, oh, I want a kind of music that does this certain thing, you know, you you have a way of thinking about it, you have tools to work with, and you have very specific avenues to kind of stretch what you already know to go to new places. And that's usually how this kind of feeling of, you know, needing to be satisfied by composition gets satisfied. And, um... You, if you really can't do improvisation that fits in the moment, you know, there's nothing you're going to do that's going to feel right. You know, if you really need to learn how to be in the moment first with any type of music, you need to just be able to be present to whatever you're practicing or whatever you're performing. But, you know, when you want to go deeper than that, when you want to go deeper than just, you know, being, you know, enjoying just playing your instrument, you want to take your audiences further places, you have to start to look at the structure of music on a larger scale. Because, you know, you know, any kind of jamming can eventually get boring very quickly, and it, it just doesn't have the same effect it had. And you can still be really focused on it, but you all you'll become really focused is this a, a feeling of dissatisfaction of just like, I need to hear something different. It just happens to people. Um, and, and the way you get out of that is you, you find new ways to structure the music. You, you start to look at music as a whole, as a big picture, and you think of how can I create a different experience? And by creating these sort of larger structures that are different, you can create different experiences for your audience. You can reach different audiences. Like if you don't know how to play, you know, bluegrass at all, then you, you can't ever play for bluegrass audiences. If you can't like improvise for a really long time, you can't necessarily have like a really sense of spontaneity in a concert. If all you know how to do is play songs, then you can't, getting a sense of spontaneity in your performance is really, really difficult. So, you know, you, when you start to look at the structure of music on a larger scale, you're going to go new places. Um, and since what we've done so far pre is pretty much focused on blues vocabulary and just the technique of playing the phrases and even just working with that you should be able to improvise with them reasonably fluidly and you really really want to make sure you've got these pentatonic scales down that you've got the DNA phrases down and that's like a really good that's a really good foundation you should be able to feel like you can jam with just that stuff um, and any of those methods of jamming that I've talked about before will help you kind of bring those phrases into reality uh, but as soon as you want to step back and start to look at the bigger picture, that's where I want to go back to the ragas and and how they structure the performance of ragas because that's where that's where um, Indian classical music really really excels. They have these very long complex forms that take these really basic phrases and give you really systematic ways to improvise with them that develop not only the technique 
but also just just the sound of things as you go throughout the performance. And so you can say, okay, I've got this new technique. Here's how I can make a section of good sounding music out of that technique. And once I'm done with that, here's a way I can take it even further. And when I'm so like burned out on that idea, well, here's another one and another one and another one. And you can take these DNA phrases and you can play the same phrases for an hour straight, but you just have so many ways of manipulating them that they just keep getting more and more and more interesting. That's really what we want to start to get into when we want to explore what the ragas can do. So you, 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 you start by going back to the exercises that you developed in the beginning, because every exercise has a purpose. When you're working on scales, you really just want to know what are the notes I'm using. When you're working on these DNA phrases, you're looking at, okay, how do I put the notes together so they have that kind of sweet quality or that or whatever kind of vibe you're going for. It shows you how to use the notes. Um, when you are doing shifting exercises, that's basically all about freedom on the neck. You want to be able to play down here and up here and, you know, on this little odd corner of the guitar and not feel like you're lost. You know, any type of exercise you do is going to develop a new skill and then once you've improvised with it, it integrates into your larger vocabulary. So on another part of my YouTube channel, I've got my whole Ingrid series, or I guess they call it the Infinity Grid for the long form. That's how I kind of organize all my note exercises. I don't want to talk too much about that now, but if you, you know, want something that really kind of systematically says when you're at this stage of development, it's good to work on these exercises to get you to the next level, and then these exercises. a very good system for saying this is where you're at, this is a good place to go. You know, that's what I've developed that for, and that's what I use myself. Um, but in our Blues Raga series, we are starting out the whole main part of the series with all these things on phrase manipulation. It's all about taking the DNA phrases and working them and working them and working them so that you've got, you know, everything that you need to play the common types of blues with them. We started out by just introducing what the DNA phrases were in both the major and the minor pentatonic scales. The next thing we really have to do after we learned how to sort of hybridize those into, you know, phrases that have more than one DNA phrase together, we have to really focus on integrating the major and the minor pentatonic scales. Because, you know, real blues is usually not in a pure pentatonic scale. That's pretty rare. Uh, most types mix the major and the minor scale, and you can often think of them as being in sort of the, the modes of the major scale, too. You can almost look at them as being Mixolydian or Dorian, and then having the pentatonic phrase is sort of superimposed on those. So the next couple videos we're going to do is really going to focus on the mixture of the major and the minor pentatonic phrases and having those have a really, really deep bond. Because at that point, your blues phrases are really, really well battle-hardened, and you can see them in the likely context they're going to show up in, which isn't going to be mixing the major and the minor phrases a lot. Um, the next thing I really like to get into, which you, you can start this before you get that whole set done, but I really like next I like to go into the shifting grids because when you've really gotten good at shifting between the pentatonic scales, that's really what makes you feel really liberated on the whole neck. I mean, I, for me, it was an amazing feeling when I just learned all five pentatonic boxes. I realized I can play notes anywhere on the neck and they're going to be like right notes. I loved that feeling when I first got it. But then I realized, oh man, once I want to get up here when I'm down there, it was really, really hard. And that's when I developed the techniques for shifting grids, which made me feel like I can shift between any box on any string at any time. And you know, it, when you first look at it, it seems like, whoa, it seems like a lot of stuff. But once you start working on it and getting it down, you realize, oh, this is a, quite a finite exercise. And once you've got it done, you really are truly liberated on the neck. So that's a really important part of this series that I'm going to work into next. Um, after that, I really want to go more deeply into this concept of phrase states. And and because moreover, this once this is how you get to playing over chord changes. The way most people are going to want to think of this is how do I play over chord changes? Because every time you change chords or you move through a chord progression, the phrase state keeps changing. It's like what notes are going to work at any particular time is going to evolve. So I really want to break into that in great detail, and then how you use drones to develop these snapshots of what scales and what notes you play here, and what scales and notes you play here, and then here, and then here, and then how you weave it together. So that when someone plays, you know, any of many kinds of chord progressions you might show up in, you know, you know how to deal with them. And, and that's, it's somewhat of an involved process to learn how to play first over chords and then to play over chord progressions. But it's very, very worth doing. It's, it's absolutely critical if you want to go jam with people. 
Um, so that's the next thing. And at, at that point, we're going to start to get to some into some more heady, some more interesting advanced stuff. One thing I want to do is a lesson I want to call Blues Juice Concentrate. It's, I guess that's my funky title for the lesson, but it, it's all about style. It's all about saying, when you look at a, at a style of music, how do you figure out where the blues influence is coming in? And this is about going back to the DNA phrases and saying, where do these show up, both in the blues and in styles that are not the blues? Because then you can understand not only where the blues has gone, but also it, it, it ends up being a really important tool for songwriters. Because if you want to say, I want to have my own sound or I want to develop my own style, being able to understand how other people put together their style gives you a really clear window into the tools you need to develop your own. So that's what that lesson is going to focus on. Uh, and for, for really advanced players, I'm going to start to do um, a lesson on managing your lick library. You know, once you've been playing for a long time, you know, you, you almost forget how, you, you almost feel like you've forgotten more blues licks than you've actually know how to play at any particular time. It's, it's, it's very difficult to manage all the things that you've learned and you don't want to forget things that you've worked on. So I am going to do a lesson on managing your lick library and, you know, giving you strategies for how to absorb new licks so that rather than learning entire solos note for note, you can get the really, really good parts of them right out and work them into your vocabulary in a meaningful way. And then I'll talk about the processes of doing that. And then that'll kind of wrap up the whole section of the series where we talk about manipulating the DNA phrases. Everything up to there is really all about you know, momentary improvisation. How do you deal with what's going to happen at any particular moment of music? The next stage is where we start to talk about long forms of improvisation and how you use the raga forms of performance to just do free improvisation on these, on these DNA phrases, but how to develop it further and further and further. And that's really what's going to start to take your technique and push it to a whole nother level. And it's going to give you new ways of performing that will just let, let you let you reach audiences in an entirely new way, um, in a way that's completely spontaneous and in a way that you can just extend for as long as you want while keeping it interesting. You know, for players who have the problem of, oh, I feel like I play solos for a while, but they get boring, this is going to like, you know, wipe that problem out entirely. Um, for people who are just looking for a new way to perform, for something new and creative, um, you know, the, the style of performing with ragas is, it, it's, it, it's a very... It's a very pure form of improvisation where it's like you don't you don't ever feel like you have to repeat stuff, and that creates a totally different feeling for audiences. And the other real advantage of performing in the raga forms is that it gives you a really deep sense of organization about everything you do. It's a really it's a really high genius style of performance because the you know being in the moment and being able to improvise is tied together with being able to structure a long performance and being able to weave your technique together with the sound of what's happening with the music and the style that you're playing. It's, just, it's, a, it's a very complete, very advanced level of improvisation that's really going to you know, push you to new creative heights, and it's, it, I'm, I'm so excited for that part of the series. It just makes me gaga thinking about it. So that's how you know what's coming. That's the scope of what we're going to cover. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're always free to jump around, but at least now you know what's there and what order I recommend you do things in. And uh, yeah... I think enough talk. It's time to go on to the next thing. I think the shifting grids are next. Yeah, the shifting grids are next. Check those out. They're pretty awesome. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.